Hi, and thanks for joining us at The Impact on fintech.tv. Today, I'm joined by Bob Litterman, who is chairman of the Risk Committee and co-founder at Kepos Capital. Bob, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm a huge fan of the work that you do and uh, really been following you for a long time. So I appreciate you coming on the show today. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Bob, you just come off really what I think is a historic report with the CFTC. And uh, the work that you did there was really amazing and has really hit the industry quite hard and remarkably because it's really the first bipartisan work that has come out around climate change and climate risk. And, and I think the markets have really woken up and taken it quite seriously. Can you talk a little bit about just what went into doing that, um, how it came together, and then we can talk about the effect that it's had on the marketplace? Sure, happy to. And uh, the credit here goes primarily to uh, Commissioner Russ Benham, who uh, is uh, one of the five uh, CFTC commissioners who's re responsible for the Market Risk Advisory Committee, which is a standing committee of the CFTC and provides input from market participants. And uh, Commissioner Benham said, well, you know, I, I guess that climate risk is an important risk in the financial system that isn't being otherwise, uh, you know, focused on by financial regulators. And the commission uh, agreed and the, uh, the Market Risk Advisory Committee created this uh, subcommittee to focus on climate related market risks. Uh, when Commissioner Benham came to me over a year ago and said, Bob, would you be willing to chair this subcommittee? I have to tell you, Jeff, I was quite surprised that someone was even forming this committee and, and that it right. was coming out of the CFTC was quite interesting as well. It wasn't the Fed or the FSOC or the SEC, which are all, you know, regulators where you might expect this to originate. But in any case, I said, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do this. I, I have a background in risk management and you're setting up a risk committee. I said, I think that would be an interesting exercise. And then I also give the commissioner credit for giving us quite a broad mandate. Uh, he, he said very clearly at the beginning that I understand that the CFTC can't act alone. And so, you know, if you can provide us with a roadmap for managing climate risk in the financial system, you have to address all of the regulators that are gonna be uh, involved and, and frankly go outside of that system as well if necessary. And it, he also said he wanted to have a consensus report and uh, he wanted to uh, put on the subcommittee a diverse group of stakeholders in the U.S. financial system. So it included not only banks and insurance companies and investors and asset owners, kind of the obvious choices, but also uh, corporations such as some oil companies and some ag companies, very active in the uh, derivatives markets, and then uh, academics and uh, you know, environmental NGOs, data and uh, analytics uh, companies and exchange. So it was a very uh, broad group. And uh, we were able to uh, achieve a lot of what uh, the commissioner asked for. We, we did focus on creating a consensus. And, you know, that's, that's kind of a high bar because if you have any one participant who says no, then it's not a consensus. Uh, and so we, we focused on what can we agree on. Now, the commissioner also wanted it to be a high level report. He said, you know, 50 pages. Well, it turned out when we figured out what we agreed on, it was a lot more than we could fit into 50 pages. I would we, imagine. Uh, yeah, we broke into uh, work streams uh, ranging from, you know, what are the authorizations of the financial regulators to, uh, what kind of data and analytics are needed to manage climate risk to, uh, you know, what are international regulators doing and, uh, you know, how can we be consistent and, and how are we different from uh, the financial markets in other countries and, and the legal systems. And we came up with 53 uh, specific recommendations and uh, the, the most important 
and the most urgent and the first recommendation of this report that we all agreed on is that we have to put a price on uh, carbon emissions and that that is a function of the Congress, not of the financial system. We all recognize that the financial system is very, very efficient at allocating, you know, flows of capital toward the incentives that it's given, toward making money given the incentives that are there. And right now, those incentives do not penalize the externalities included in fossil fuels. And so the capital of our great economy is flowing in the same directions in terms of the you know, existing fossil fuel driven economy. And, uh, and, th and that's true not only in the United States, but globally, we need strong globally harmonized incentives to reduce emissions. And everyone in the financial markets understands that. It's pretty amazing how much we could agree on here. So I'm curious, is the roadblock, and, and obviously we'll talk about politics a little bit, but is the roadblock just the right entity to come in and uh, make this move? Or is it a political roadblock that we're dealing with? Is the markets, I guess the markets aren't gonna come at it on their own because as you said, they're incented by the current system. So are we really waiting for a political shift? We're waiting to fix a bug in the tax code, Jeff. It's as simple as that. Just like any bug in computer code, you know, once you identify it, it should be fixed. And the fundamental flaw here in our economy is that we don't have appropriate incentives to reduce emissions. And as long as we don't have those incentives, you know, no one is going to change their behavior. Incentives, right. and I'm an economist, incentives are as fundamental as you can get. If you want to change behavior, you have to change incentives. That's what incentives are. They're anything that will change behavior. They do come in lots of different forms. So you can have low carbon fuel standards and you can have renewable portfolio standards. Those are incentives to reduce emissions. You have gasoline taxes. That's an incentive to reduce emissions because you don't pay that if you have an electric vehicle. You get to use the same roads. So, you know, but the reality is we need strong incentives to reduce emissions. And that really means pricing carbon. And that's the purview of Congress. So, you know, if the I, Fed I wanted to... to do that, it couldn't do it. If the CFTC wanted to do it, it can't do it. If I'm, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs, and I think this is a great idea, I can't do it. You know, some companies put what they call shadow prices, but, you know, you, you, that gives you shadow profits. I'll right. tell you what, an executive worries a heck of a lot more about real profits than shadow profits. That's me, the sense in which we can't do it on our own. Yeah, let this me has ask you to be done by Congress. Yeah, Bob, I'm I'm super curious because there are a lot of advisors out there that that certainly I spend a lot of time trying to educate around climate change and climate risk and ESG and sustainable investing. And there's still you know a pretty big divide out there in that community of people that even believe that climate change is an issue. So I want to emphasize a, a really to me, a salient point of what you have already really stated is that you had representatives of oil companies on this commission and still came out with the recommendation that you need to have a price on carbon. And, and yeah. there was no resistance from those companies? No, none at all. And those companies are also part of the coalition that we have formed at the Climate Leadership Council, where, you know, I'm, I'm also on the board there. I, in fact, I'm co-chair with Catherine Murdoch, and we've got a bipartisan bill to price carbon. And we have founding members who have worked with us for, you know, over a year now, several years, to come up with the details of that plan. And, and that includes uh, many of the leading oil and gas companies and, and their executives the CEOs of the leading oil and gas companies met with the Pope over a year ago at the Vatican and promised to uh, support carbon pricing and do so in a transparent and open way. And, you know, they're in line with their shareholders, which who also believe that we should be pricing carbon. And uh, so this is something that, that we all agree on. And, uh, you know, one of the leading oil companies, uh, when they sent their representative, and, and the commissioner was really good about talking to these companies and asking for the appropriate person. We didn't want someone from their legal department or someone from their 
uh, government relations, we got someone from risk there. In fact, the head of risk management. And, you know, when a bunch of risk management professionals get together and talk about what do we need to do about managing risk, there's no one who says, are we sure this is real? (laughs) We're sure enough that it's real that we better manage the risk. You know, we don't don't know what's coming. That's for sure. No one can tell you exactly what's going to come. And that's part of appropriate risk management. As you know, in financial markets, you don't worry about the expected outcome particularly not if you have the name risk manager on your title, you worry about the extreme but plausibly bad outcomes. Right. That may be really bad. And so you have to be prepared for them. And, you know, when we sat around as a risk committee for the first time and went around the room, I raised the question. I said, look, I think we need appropriate incentives to reduce emissions. Is there anyone who disagrees with that? And by the way, I don't think you can disagree with that because the answer is embedded in the word appropriate, what it means. Right. How can you say, I don't want appropriate incentives? So now we're not arguing about the reality of climate change. We're arguing about how dangerous is this and what is the appropriate trade-off between consumption today and consumption in the future. And to be honest, we didn't address that. That, that, is, that was beyond the purview of this committee is to say, what's the appropriate price or how do we want to structure a carbon pricing bill? That, that is definitely part of the role of Congress. But we said, look, the first thing that we have to do as a society, if we want to address climate risk, is we have to create appropriate incentives to reduce emissions. Not pricing the risk is the fundamental flaw. Everyone agrees with that. That is the fundamental flaw. Until we fix it, we're not on the road to a net zero economy. And we have to get on the road to a net zero economy. The cost of delay here is incredible. You know, when you're managing risk, time is a scarce resource. We can solve risk management problems if we have enough time. Any risk management problem, if we have enough time. It's when we run out of time that a risk can become a catastrophe. And we don't have to look far, Jeff. Look at the COVID crisis. That was another risk management crisis that has a lot of lessons for addressing climate risk. And one of those lessons is you don't want to waste time because you can run out of time. And that's what happened with COVID. You know, there was a study from Columbia University that showed that in the beginning in March, had we addressed it one week earlier in the New York area, we could have cut the number of deaths in that region in half. Right. The beginning. And, you know, if we had addressed it like China or South Korea or many countries around the world where they snuffed it out, well, they're, they're you know, look where we are, look where they are. So time is a scarce resource. And the same thing applies with climate. And then there's other, you know, important lessons, one of which is that our well-being depends on the actions of others, you know. And another one being that, you know, we all inhabit the same planet. You can't build a wall around your country and pretend that things outside your country don't affect you. They do. And uh, so we've got to take all of that into account as we think about climate risk and think about the world that we're creating for future generations. They are going to suffer if we don't take action soon. So let, let's talk about where we are politically. I mean, we're in very interesting times. We, we think we have... Um, you know, President Biden, um, but based on certain legal challenges, that's still a little bit up in the air. We're waiting for some runoff elections, so we're not exactly sure who has control of the Senate, but it does look like it's leaning, you know, at this point towards the Republicans. So we, we don't have as much support, maybe necessarily, that Biden would need to institute some of these policies and get a price. Um, how, how do you think the future is going to play out over the next four years if this remains the, the current situation. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, it, it, let's assume for the purpose of this discussion that the Senate is in the Republican hands. That makes it much harder for the Biden administration to pursue an aggressive policy on climate. Um, and, and frankly, it means that you need a bipartisan uh, policy. Uh, so so I think in the, uh, let's say, uh, direction of climate policy to moderate Republicans, 
uh, many of which have supported carbon pricing in the past and may support it going forward. So we'll see, but uh, certainly I expect less uh, uh, spending on, you know, uh, renewables and uh, other climate friendly uh, policies, because I think the Republicans are probably going to make it difficult to, to spend the trillions of dollars that the Biden administration wanted to spend. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we'll see what happens in terms of the Republican uh, Party's support for uh, pricing carbon. Uh, you know, Republicans in the past have supported market-based approaches. They understand the importance, or they have historically understood the importance of incentives. They seem to have lost their way a little bit under uh, President Trump. And, uh, and, and the problem hasn't gone away, you know. The inevitable policy response, as some people call it, is going to be to price carbon and to start a rapid transition toward the net zero economy. The rest of the world is already on that path. The number of countries and companies and investors around the world who have pledged uh, to be carbon neutral by 2050 uh, or to be aligned with a 1.5 degree uh, warming of the planet, uh, two, two ways of saying the same thing, that we're prepared for a rapid transition, that's only grown. And so I can't tell you exactly how or when the U.S. policy is going to change other than it will change. And uh, one of the things that gives me hope is that, you know, I look at the relative valuations of stranded assets, things like coal and oil and tar sands relative to, you know, renewable assets and, and more generally the market as a whole. And those fossil fuel assets have underperformed dramatically dramatically over the last 10 years. Uh, last year, that is 2019, they were down 23% relative to the market as a whole. Uh, 2020, they are down another 20 some percent. And in fact, uh, the day of the election, uh, well, November 3rd was the election. November 4th, when the results became clear that Biden was likely to be the winner, the market was up three and a half percent. Well, no, the market ended. It was at one point up over three percent. It was up three. Yep. It ended the day. Let's say the S and P five hundred about up two point two percent. Yeah. Coal assets were down about six percent. So right. that tells you something about how stranded asset valuation. And oil companies were up, but they weren't up nearly as much. And so uh, the market thinks that this transition is going to continue, and the valuations of those assets reflect that. And I'm optimistic that that's just going to continue. And uh, so as an investor uh, or as an asset owner, I think, you, you know, you want to place your bets on a rapid transition. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Did the committee also look at physical transition risk as well as carbon pricing? Or was it mostly focused on? No, no, it, it absolutely. Look, the, the real yeah, it, it, these are emerging risks, and we do focus on the distinction between transition risk and physical risks. But the real risk in my mind is the long-term physical risks that are emerging, whether it's sea level rise, flooding from stronger storms, which combines with sea level rise for coastal communities, or wildfires in California, or heat waves, or the impacts on health, or the impacts on national security. Uh, food production, uh, et cetera. Uh, these are existential threats to the planet. And that's what climate risk is really all about. Now, from the point of view of financial markets, yes, there's also the question about the transition and if it's disorderly. And in particular, you know, if the valuations of certain companies fall precipitously because investors have a, what some, some people call a Minsky moment, <laughs> that everyone wakes up and realizes, oh, my God, uh, we're going to have to do something. I don't think it's going to happen that way. Uh, as I say, these valuations have already, of already fossil fuel assets have already collapsed. They're looking they're forward looking. And, and we haven't had a, uh, a recession, much less a collapse. I mean, we had a COVID related recession. It had right. nothing to do with the collapse in valuations of fossil fuel companies. So. I'm not nearly as worried about, and I don't think the CFTC panel was as worried about transition risk. Now, having said that, 
Is it legitimate to worry about it? Of course. Look at what happened with mortgages when we didn't price the risk embedded in mortgages appropriately right. a little over a decade ago. And they did collapse. And there were those at the time who said, well, how could valuations of subprime mortgages bring down the economy? It's only, you know, whatever it was, a hundred billion, I think it was. But, you know, it turns out that, you know, there are these knock on effects and interactions and so on. So I don't, I don't want to claim that transition risk is not a serious risk that we should worry about. But the real risks of climate, I think, are much greater. And those are the physical impacts. So now that you're off the board, what's next on your agenda? Oh, my God. Well, my agenda is driven by pricing carbon, uh, by creating those appropriate incentives to reduce emissions and, and creating a, uh, a globally harmonized incentive to reduce emissions. That's, that's what we've got to do. And I, you know, uh, it's not clear how that's going to happen or when it's going to happen. But, uh, you know, part of what I do is educate uh, investors about the fact that it's coming and that, you know, they have risk in their portfolios and opportunities, risks and opportunities. You know, at the World Wildlife Fund, it was uh, seven years ago that we addressed it in our portfolio. And uh, what we did is we hedged out the valuations of the stranded assets in our portfolio, which were pretty tiny at the time. It wasn't really a huge risk for us. But those assets have underperformed uh, by you know, over 15% annually. And so this uh, stranded asset swap, which went long the market and short stranded assets, has been the best performing position in our portfolio. It was designed to reduce the risk. I wish we had made it about 15 times bigger and then it would have produced more <laughs> returns. But, you know, in any case, you can look at it as a risk reduction strategy or a uh, return enhancement opportunity strategy. And the other thing I would say is, you know, seven years ago, it was pretty simple minded approach, sell stranded assets and buy the market. Today, those stranded asset valuations are, are much, much lower. And I think, uh, you know, a better way to approach this is to say what is going to be the impact, both positive and negative, of uh, a rapid transition to a low carbon economy? And what should I do not only in the oil and gas sector or the coal sector, but what should I do in automotives? What should I do in, you know, mining and materials and, uh, you know, tech and uh, direct air capture or, you know, carbon allowances? There are a lot of ways to play this transition. And I think investors should be thinking about it from all of those perspectives. And well, that's just, th that by the way, is just the return and the, you know, and, and risk uh, part of the equation because investors have an important uh, role in terms of governance and right. governance responsibilities. And, uh, and so there's a lot of other things that investors and asset managers can be doing. And in terms of, uh, you know, weighing in on policy options as well. So there's a lot to be done. If Biden is listening, I just want to say it right here. I, I could picture climate czar Bob Litterman. So oh. <laughs> that's the, the next role for you, Bob. <laughs> well, I hope we have a climate czar because that would be a good sign. And, yes. uh, and a coordinated policy from the president can be very important and very effective. So that's a big change that I think we're going to have in the next four years. And I hope the, the Democrats come together around climate policy and, uh, you know, and that we continue to have increasing focus on this because the problem is not going away. It's only right. getting worse. The way I think about it, and I'm, I'm afraid this is not a very, uh, you know, uplifting approach, is that every, you know, year of delay means that there's more uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, and it means we've pushed off addressing the problem longer. And that means that ultimately the maximum temperature is gonna be that much higher. We can't right. get back. Had we addressed this 30 years ago, it wouldn't be an existential problem for the planet. You know, we would, we would probably be near the maximum temperature and it would be lower than we're at today. And you know, we could survive. There's still damages, obviously, but they're not existential threats at the current temperature. But if we were to stay here or go higher, and because we didn't do anything for the last 20 or 30 years, and we can't turn back that clock, 
inevitably we're going to get up instead of one degree C of warming, something greater than one and a half, probably 1.7 or 1.8. And if we put this off another, you know, two years, we're going to be, you know, that much further, you know, closer to another 10th of a degree higher. So right. that's, that's the sad reality. And we don't know where that, you know, call it a tipping point or cliff or nonlinearity might exist. There's, there's some temperature at which we are going to go off that cliff. We just don't know where that's at. And so right. every year of delay is just causing the risk from climate change to explode. It's really sad. Well, the one thing that does give me hope is that smart guys like you are working on the problem. So oh, I, the I fix wanna... is so easy. We I just can't. need to change this bug. Exactly. <laughs> we understand it. And it's you're right. It's a political friction. And we've yeah. got to change that friction. And that friction globally, sadly, is centered right now in the United States. And in the United States, it's centered in the U.S. Senate. And within the U.S. Senate, I would say Mitch McConnell is the leader right now. So we can put a name on it. Now, right. I don't think we're going to change Mitch McConnell. But I think we can focus a lot of attention on uh, on, on Republican senators who know better and right. have been afraid in the past to come out. And I think it's just, at this point, it's so obvious. And the Republican Party needs to recognize the reality of climate risk. Denial is no longer a, a, a relevant political strategy. You know, it's only in this country. The Republican Party in this country is the only political party on earth that is still pretending that this doesn't exist it's ridiculous it's insane Jeff. yes it's got to change and it will change. Bob, thank you so much for joining us today i could talk about this all day but i don't know if the listeners will listen all day so <laughs> we'll right. leave it at that and hopefully you'll come on the show again as things progress politically over the next few months we have a better sense of where we're going love to have you back on thanks jeff my pleasure and i'll be happy to come back on